So moving along, because we now have another talk that's on a topic that uh, we that that overlaps with the one that we've just heard about. Uh, and uh, this is going to be Sonia Norman, who will be talking about novel psychotherapy for PTSD and related problems. And uh, Sonia is a professor in our department. Uh, she is the director of the PTSD consult program at UCSD. Uh, she also shows that she is incredibly bright because she's interested in addictions as well. Bless you. Uh, and so, we're, and those two disorders, PTSD and substance use disorders, are indeed closely intertwined. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing about novel uh, psychotherapies. Thank you. Come on up. Um, the yellow light goes on at three minutes. Oh, and this goes forward. Ah, yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, okay. Um, so I'm actually not going to talk about my addictions work today, <laughs> but I do want to mention it briefly because um, when I was junior faculty here, uh, I sort of took for granted that I had a clinical role, um, first at UCSD outpatient psychiatry and then at the VA, and also an academic role, so I was doing clinical administrative work and research, and I thought that was really common. Um, and it wasn't until I took a national role with VA, with the National Center for PTSD, and started working with colleagues at other um, very high-profile academic VAs like Boston and West Haven, and I realized that's not common at all. You have the clinicians and you have the researchers, and they really don't cross paths. And I can't imagine what my research would be if I, wasn't, if I didn't wear both hats. And I'm so appreciative to UCSD that that is our model here. Um, as a quick example, I have been studying how to treat PTSD with co-occurring addiction, um, and my work and that of others is really showing that what's highly disseminated is actually less effective than other forms of treatment. And I recently finished a study that really, I think, uh, put the nail in the head of, of that, um, and I was able to go back to VA and get several hundred thousand dollars to put together a meeting of every VA has a PTSD substance use disorder specialist. Um, we're going to fly them out. We're going to train them in the effective therapy. We're going to use implementation science to help them go back and really be effective in implementing this new model. Um, so I feel like I had got my ideas from my clinical work. I was able to get grants to do the clinical trials, and now I'm able to implement it. And I just um, I think that's really rare, and I'm really appreciative of being here, being able to do that. What I am going to talk about today is guilt um, and shame, and that also emerged from my clinical work. Um, around 2007, 2008, I took a position with the VA through our faculty as well, um, running a PTSD program for veterans who had served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And at that point, I, w I really wanted to create an evidence-based psychotherapy clinic, and our treatments at that time, and that has evolved, but at that time, were very much fear-based. It was help helping people overcome their fear, their anxiety from their traumatic event. But what I saw in my own patients and in my colleagues and my trainees who were coming to me is they were saying, um, the person who's presenting to me is an anxious, but they're sitting there in so much pain because of what they did or didn't do the, during the traumatic event that they now have to live with. And, um, and we started thinking about this. Others were thinking about this at this time, too, and calling it moral injury, which has also since progressed. We really started thinking about it as guilt and shame. And looking at the literature, guilt is the, I feel terrible because I did something bad. And shame is, I am bad because of what I did. It's when it really diffuses to the whole self. And we're really looking at both. So we started looking at the literature. I'll thank my collaborators briefly. Um, and what we found is that guilt is very common in trauma. So remember, this is before DSM-5, and DSM-5 has really supported this in that now guilt and shame are actually a symptom of PTSD. They weren't at the time. Um, but a lot of people with PTSD or who've been exposed to trauma endorse guilt in their lifetime or currently endorse it, um, and that they're bothered by the guilt. And um, early work with Vietnam-era veterans that occurred about 30 years after Vietnam actually showed that that guilt does not resolve on its own. Veterans are at high risk of guilt and at shame, and I think initially this work made sense to do with veterans. You know, in the context of war, of course, people are um, doing things that go against the values that they might live, in, live by in their day-to-day -day life. 
Um, we started collecting data on what things people felt guilt and shame about. Um, and we met, uh, we t several people told us that, you know, they had to make the choice of whether to shoot a child or not. The child was approaching, they had something uh, ambiguous on their body, it could have been an explosive device, they had clear orders, they knew what to do. Um, and of course the people who shot had a lot of guilt. But then I was seeing people who hadn't shot and they said, I froze, I failed, I put everyone at risk. Um, and they were ashamed because of that. And of course these these are people who were 18 at the time. They had to make this decision. Um, and now they live with this for the rest of their life. And so that just showed me how, um, how prevalent and how difficult this was. Um, but you know, now that we've been studying this for a decade and we see how common it is across, um, this is not a veteran issue, right? People feel guilty for having stayed in abusive relationships. They feel uh, guilty for driving after having a drink and killing someone in a motor vehicle accident. This is really common across trauma. So we started trying to understand the relationship between guilt and psychopathology. And over the last decade, we've written a series of papers on this. So um, we've seen in, our, in my clinic, I started collecting data on everyone who was coming in with PTSD. And in our clinical trials at baseline and through treatment, we were measuring guilt along with other aspects of PTSD. And what we started to see uh, was that guilt really um, is related to a lot of post-traumatic problems. PTSD is one, right? But we also see a lot of depression. We also see a lot of functional problems. We also see substance use. Um, we see a higher risk of suicide and suicidal ideation. Across all of these, we started seeing guilt as a, as a mediating factor between trauma exposure and the severity of those problems. So this is a study where we looked at um, functioning. We looked at depressive symptoms, post-traumatic symptoms. Um, we've looked at uh, risk of aggression or aggress uh, aggressive behavior. Um, and in all cases, we found that there is this, uh, if there's more guilt and shame, there's greater severity of those problems. Um, we came up with a model, and this was toward the effort of starting to think about a treatment for guilt and shame related to trauma. And so the way we started thinking about it, which has been both kind of informed by our research and now also giving us a lot of testable hypotheses, is, which one is the, all right, um, I'll just, um, so trauma, <laughs> which one there's is the? Another, no, there's another way to that, uh, that's much easier, which is going to be here. Oh, no, okay. I was just going to do the oh, so blinker. Now. Oh, the blinker, uh, that's the top. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so let me go back. Okay. okay, so what we start, thank you. So what we started thinking about was, um, you know, most people in their lifetime are exposed to trauma. Um, some have guilt related to that trauma, some don't. Um, guilt can, so you're talking to this is a little difficult. Okay, guilt, um, guilt can be pro-social, right? If someone has guilt after an event and they ask themselves, why do I feel guilty? Um, they might say, um, oh my gosh, I really offended that person. That feels really bad to me. That's not how I want to live my life. And they, it might uh, help them take uh, some action, like apologize or commit to being a kinder person going forward. So guilt can be positive. But one of the things we know that puts people at risk for developing mental health problems after trauma is an avoidant coping style, where they don't examine their behavior or why they're feeling bad about something. They don't want to do that. That's very distressing to them. So we think if, if guilt is appraised, it might actually have a helpful role. But if there's a void in coping, then guilt, which is a blend of cognitions and emotions, that I did something bad feeling without really looking at what that is, feels really bad, and I feel so bad, I must have done really, something really bad, kind of becomes this cycle, and then it could break out into that I am bad as well. And then what we're seeing in our research is that this cycle, as the guilt increases, also contributes to substance use, PTSD, depression, suicidal ideation, and poorer functioning. Um, so we did decide that we were going to develop a psychotherapy that really tackled this kind of guilt and shame from trauma. And the reason that we thought this was a good idea is that um, as we've talked about through other uh, lectures today, PTSD, we have effective treatments for PTSD, but they don't fully resolve PTSD. They don't work for everyone. We're not done. And we also see that um, PTSD is one problem people have after trauma. It's not the only one. And we're seeing that guilt and shame seem to contribute to multiple problems, not just PTSD, but also depression, substance use. 
um, we're seeing that the severity of these problems is greater when people have guilt and shame. Um, and what we know from looking at our best evidence-based treatments for PTSD is that not all of them reduce guilt, and that when guilt is higher, the treatments might be less effective. So it seems like we really need to directly target guilt and shame. And in some questionnaire kind of studies, we see clinicians asking for more interventions for guilt. Like the people who came to me in my clinic, they're saying, I don't know how to treat this. So about a decade ago, we started working on trauma-informed guilt and shame reduction. I believe Murray Steen, who was my postdoc mentor and mentor on my K award, might have, and is uh, very gifted at acronyms, might have helped come up with this. Um, and what we do is a, it's a very short treatment. It's only about six sessions. We teach people about the role of guilt and shame and trauma and how common it is and some of the ways it affects them. And then we spent the bulk of the therapy on what we call a guilt appraisal. And this is very cognitive behavioral. We really help them look at what happens. So I'll give you, this is the bulk of the therapy and there's many different exercises. I'll show you one example. So uh, this was a patient that I saw who um, the situation was that he was deployed to a war zone. And he and his unit had to interview a family um, to get information. And that night the family was killed by insurgents. And then his unit had to turn around and actually clean out the house and, um, where the family had been killed. Um, so guilt and shame is hard to identify because that right there sounds bad, right? I mean, he's feeling some responsibility for these folks getting killed. Um, in fact, as we go through the therapy and we really try to drill down, what he felt bad about was that People in his unit were making very crass jokes about the people who were killed, and he took part in it. And he felt that when he took part in it, he lost some of his humanity. And that was really the suffering for him. That was what he carried with him. And so this exercise is called a justification analysis. Again, it's just one small piece of a, of a much larger intervention. But what we do is we say, you've been telling yourself you made the wrong choice and that there was a right choice that had you made this right choice, things would have been okay. Um, and um, you've been telling, but you haven't actually, because of this avoidance, really examined that. So let's really break this down. Let's look at the pros and cons of what you did, and let's explore other options that were truly available to you at the time, not sort of magical ones or ones that came to you later, but things you really could have done at the time. And so he came up with, you know, we could, I could have stopped and mourned this nice family or I could have told everyone else to stop too and said, hey, this is not okay, act appropriately. Um, so this was a very short, kind of odd guy who was being bullied a lot by his unit. He stood out a lot to an almost dangerous extent. And um, when we talked about the pros and cons of what he did, uh, what he actually did was he was able to get the job done because had he stopped to mourn, he might have fallen apart. He might not have been able to do his mission that day, which was to, um, he had a job to do. And by putting that aside, he was able to do it. By sort of taking part in um, what was happening, he was able to do it. It allowed him to cope, cope, and it allowed him to pull his weight, which was very important considering he was already being bullied and isolated. But the con was he had to live with having disrespected this family. Had he stopped and mourned, it would have he would have felt human, um, but he would have stood out further. He wouldn't have pulled his weight. He might have pulled, put others in danger because it would have taken everyone else longer to get the job done. Had he told everyone to act appropriately, he again would have stood out. Um, he would have alienated himself further. And in fact, his um, staff sergeant was taking part in this, so he would have been insubordinate and possibly like, gotten himself in actual you know, legal trouble. Um, so what he walked away with wasn't that, um, hey, this is great, like I feel so much better, what a fantastic thing I did, but he walked away understanding that there was no good option, and in fact, there was some reasoning behind what he did, and um, in fact, it, it might have helped his survival and helped him finish out his tour, which was very important to him. Um, so that, like I said, that's one of many exercises. The final piece of this is that we talk about um, People are telling themselves that they're evil, they're bad, 
um, but in fact, they're suffering so much about this violation of their values that it shows that their values are very important to them. So we help make that connection, and then we say well, you can't undo what was done, but we help them really identify their values and um, move forward in a way that lives closer, lives more closely day to day with their values. And so the, I, the idea there is that if we start wrestling this pain and this guilt away from them, they're not going to buy that. But if we fill out their life with other things that feel meaningful, where they feel good about how they're spending their time, maybe they themselves will let go of that guilt and shame a little bit. Um, so we did a pilot study, and we did see that the therapy reduced um, th guilt cognitions, beliefs about how wrong they were, how much they should have known better, how justified their actions were. And we saw, even though we weren't directly targeting PTSD or depression, we saw significant changes in both. So we're currently in the, uh, toward the end, actually, of a DOD-funded two-site study here and through Brown University. We're comparing our intervention to supportive therapy. People do not have to have PTSD to get into the study. They do have to be veterans who served in Iraq or Afghanistan. That was a requisite of the Department of Defense to fund this. Um, but they can have PTSD, depression, substance use, suicide. Having said this, over 90% of the people we've enrolled have met criteria for PTSD. And we're looking at all of these outcomes, including t taking some people who are pretty su um, high in suicidal ideation and, and seeing how this goes. Um, we've so far randomized 106 people, and we're hoping for 150. We have a book that's coming out uh, in June of the intervention, so we're really excited about that. And the book is not limited to military trauma. It's guilt and shame from any trauma. Um, and uh, the next steps of this work is really trying to do more of that effectiveness work of looking at more situations, <laughs> more trauma types, more populations. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you.